Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com for premium picks. Look us up in the sports section on Roku. We're there. Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Before I get to really a revelation, the Sean Porter demolition of Pauli Malinaji, let me just make a few points on the CompuBox numbers which have been released for the Hopkins Shumanoff fight. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe Hopkins won the fight. Let me be clear as day on it, right? You know, the fight went over, so as a gambler, I was okay on the fight. But here's what you need to know going forward. Understand that while Hopkins puts on a master class, while Hopkins lands punches at a very high percentage, right? He lands 51% of his power punches. He lands 46% of his jabs. Both are great numbers. While he was very accurate, Understand that according to CompuBox, and I believe this is right just based on my own two eyes watching the fight, Hopkins was so low volume that there is not a round in this fight where he throws more punches than his opponent. Right? Twelve rounds, his opponent throws more punches than him every round. Right? Let me just give you an idea. I'm just going to refer to the first half of the fight. First round, the opponent throws 12 more punches than Hopkins. Second round, the opponent throws 20 more punches than Hopkins. Third round, 18. Fourth round, 24. Fifth round, 19. Sixth round, 17. Understand. That there are multiple rounds in this fight. I haven't even gotten to some of the later rounds. There are multiple rounds in this fight, like the eighth round, where his opponent throws more than 20 more punches than Bernard Hopkins. Right? Now, Hopkins only throws 383 punches the entire fight. Right? He's low volume at this point in his career he needs to make the quality of the punches matter right defense is paramount because he can be outworked even by overmatched opponents like Babu Chumanov now understand what's troubling here just in terms of going forward is the fact that according to CompuBox, Shumanov threw more jabs than Hopkins and landed them at greater than 20%. Shumanov landed his jab at 21%. Now what that tells me is, as masterful as Hopkins looks in the ring, he needs to pace himself. He's vulnerable against a higher volume jabber with some boxing skills. Right? Fighters fighting Hopkins should go in the ring thinking volume, right? Because you can outwork Bernard now, now that Bernard's 49 years old, and you need to think about pumping that jab because the jab's getting through. Right? Hopkins doesn't move as well as he once did. So keep that in mind. In an earlier video, I pointed out that the judge who scored the fight for Shumanov, while I disagreed with him, I myself gave Shumanov the early rounds. Right? The point is simply even a technician who's a master at angles can lose rounds by being outworked. Right? Keep that in mind as you think about Hopkins. If he fights Adonis Stevenson, I'd take Hopkins in that fight. I think Stevenson's too one-handed. But were I Stevenson's corner, I would have Stevenson not even try to knock out Hawkins. I would have Stevenson come in and try to pump a lot of jabs, move around the ring, force Hopkins to be on his 
front foot. Right? Let me point out, if I were to fight Floyd Mayweather, I would employ the same strategy. Unfortunately, as I see it, the one constant in boxing is that father time eventually catches up to everyone. Right? KG defensive fighters like Hopkins have learned how to be very accurate on their back foot when young pups come to them like Babel Chumanoff did. Right? The key against the Hopkins is not to come to him but to hover around him, pump a jab and force him to be active. Right? I encourage everyone to just Google the CompuBox numbers today. Let's talk about Sean Porter. Now I make mental notes to myself after every fight, win or lose. Sometimes I learn something, sometimes I don't. Right? Let's talk about some recent fights. I've had some misses. Right? The uh, Khabib Alekverdiev fight. You know what? I didn't learn anything in that fight because I thought Alekverdiev won the fight. HBO thought so. Others have thought so. Boxing scene thought so. Um, I guess the only thing I learned is that Jesse Vargas got a gift. I consider Jesse Vargas to be a vulnerable champion. Right? Put me down right now as picking Kalikverdiev in the rematch just like I did before their first fight. Right? Usmani, Ray Beltran. Let's talk about that fight. Usmani was an underdog. That was just a play on an underdog in a fight I considered a toss-up. But understand... Beltran has some of the same problems that Hopkins does, right? Beltran got outthrown in that fight. He won the fight. I thought he landed the more meaningful punches. I'm not here to say he didn't win the fight, but understand Usmani, a last-minute replacement, shows up, goes the distance, and throws more punches than Ray Beltran, right? It seemed to me that Ray Beltran, who's not in his late 40s like Bernard Hopkins. Seemed to me that he's in his early 30s and he had to pace himself. He had a hard time landing punches against a slippery moving opponent. Now Ray Beltran's profile has been raised because he looked awfully good against former champion Ricky Burns. But Ricky Burns since then has lost his title of Terence Crawford in a fight where Burns looked very limited. Right, Ray Beltran going forward, I would wonder how he would do against a guy who can hover, make it a volume contest, who has more power than Usmani, who was jumping up a weight class. Right, a guy throwing Usmani's volume with more power could have done more damage on Ray Beltran. Let's talk briefly about Timothy Bradley, Manny Pacquiao. What did I learn in that fight? Number one, Timothy Bradley's body's failing him. How many fights am I going to hear the Bradley people say Bradley had leg problems? Right? Against Pacquiao the first time, Bradley had two sprained ankles. Against Pacquiao the second time, Bradley, who had a great first round, was bending his legs and everything, suffered a calf injury. It seems to me that when Bradley faces an opponent with foot speed, not a Juan Manuel Marquez, but a Manny Pacquiao, his body eventually starts to betray him. I also learned that Timothy Bradley can be mentally thrown off his game. You're fighting Manny Pacquiao, you're outboxing him, why would you ever change that game plan? Who fights Manny Pacquiao? <laughs> and then decides that they're going to swing for the fences, not in the 10th round when guys are tired, and you have a chance to catch a tired Manny Pacquiao, but in the second round like Timothy Bradley. Right? Timothy Bradley, I believe, is immensely talented. I thought if he beat Manny Pacquiao, he had a claim to being the best in his weight class for this era. That would have been decided in the ring against Floyd Mayweather, right? Bradley, unlike Sean Porter, has a longer history, right? Bradley has fought more guys. Porter now has burst on the scene. Bradley had the track record where we could say 
Over the last three or four years, who has ruled the roost? Right? Bradley has taken his name out of contention with a silly game plan against Manny Pacquiao. Swinging for the fences, really? Didn't even look like he prepared to do so. Didn't he look tired to you in the 7th, 8th, and ninth rounds? Aren't those the rounds where Bradley came off the rails and got behind in the fight? Well, let's talk about this fight. This fight was an eye-opener. Sean Porter, Paulie Malinaji. I have to tell you, the fight didn't go any way, shape, or form how I thought it would. Malinaji, to me, is a shrewd customer. He's a technician. He's excellent with the jab. He's excellent with the timing. He's excellent controlling distance. He can fight very hard punchers. Zab Judah, Miguel Cotto. And actually make them look foolish in some rounds. I know that first Cotto fight, everyone wants to remember the broken jaw fair enough. But there are rounds in that fight where Cotto looks like a little puppy. Where Malinaji looks like he has him on a leash. Right? Malinaji's excellent on movement. Right behind the jab. Looks good. Now this fight to me is qualitatively different than Malinaji's loss to Adrian Broner. There I thought Malinaji left that fight on the table. Right? I thought Malinaji stayed too close to Broner. Right? Here, Malinaji gets blown out because of Sean Porter's skill set. Right? This is a story really of Sean Porter taking the fight. Not Malinaji losing it. Malinaji comes out, he still looks like Paulie Malinaji to me. I didn't see a broken down fighter. I saw a guy pumping a jab again, you know, moving in the ring, looking decent. He looked prepared for the fight. The problem, and really the surprise for me, right, I had to take notes looking at this fight. The shock is how sudden Sean Porter is. He has a skill that not many have. The ability to throw punches from halfway across the ring. Right? And he's two-handed with it. Think Vladimir Klitschko against Eddie Chambers. Twelfth round. Klitschko's halfway across the ring. That knockout punch looks like Klitschko leaps across the ring and lands it. Think David Hay. Another guy who can be halfway across the ring and somehow has it so coordinated that he could do a drop step or something, step forward, throw the punch, and the punch, 10 feet from where we started it, still has power. Sean Porter's like those guys. And there's an extra kick to Sean Porter, unlike the other two guys. When Sean Porter gets inside he actually has an inside game. Right? When Sean Porter gets up close, he can actually mount a sustained body attack. What's interesting in this fight is that Malinaji seems surprised, almost as surprised as I was, at how Porter from way outside could literally come in and kill his angle. Right? You know, Malinaji, I'm sure, is looking at distance, right, and figuring out exactly how much he has to move so that if the opponent throws a punch, the opponent doesn't land it. Right? These are, you know, Malinaji's a guy who can lean back. Look at Malinaji against Shashenko. Right? Malinaji's a guy who trusts his body. He can lean back and have punches end right here. He knows how much he has to lean back. But not against guys like this. Sean Porter is able from way outside to not just close the distance quickly. You know, take a big step you know, literally come in with quick foot speed and be up on him. But what's really shocking about Sean Porter is he does it with both hands. In this short fight, 
he's hitting Malinaji with brutal lefts and rights. I was a bit surprised in the post-fight interview. Sean Porter, you know, gets off a great right hand and drops Paulie Malinaji. Then in the post-fight interview, to my amazement, I, I was amazed by this. Sean Porter says that he thought the right hand was there all night. That he and his corner planned on him being able to land that right hand. Who in their right mind fights Paulie Malinaji and thinks they could land right hands all night? It's hard to hit Malinaji with any hand. But figure it out. Malinaji's best punch is that left jab. Doesn't that left jab line up opposite Sean Porter's right hand? What Porter's telling you is he moves so good that against a guy with an excellent jab, he can be outside of the jab, then as the guy pulls back the jab, he can come over the jab and inflict damage. His corner expected this. Right? Shocking. In other words, Sean Porter, this was a walk in the park for him. He's a guy who's not worried about getting hit with jabs because he moves so well and so quickly that he can dodge the jab and come back in over the jab hand. Right? Porter is much more dangerous than I thought. Another thing I love about Porter is that not a lot of wasted movement while he's explosive, while he's sudden, right? While he's like Freddy Krueger. You know those horror movies? You turn around, suddenly the guy's right here. Right? You know, you saw him a second ago, he was across the parking lot, suddenly you see him and he's right here with the meat cleaver. Right? What I like with Porter too is he's not jumping around the ring. Not a lot of wasted motion. Right? This, this is different. This is surgical. He's not jumping around the ring too much, wasting energy. No, this is a guy who is strategic. Right? So, Sean Porter, I, you know, my apologies to the Sean Porter supporters. Many of you here online, Melanite, uh, Melanite X, for example, tried to warn me that Porter was vastly superior outside. Right? And I thought, you know what? I looked at Film Supporter. I looked at that first Julio Diaz film. Right? That was a draw. Right? Julio Diaz uh, is uh, Joel Diaz's brother. The same Julio Diaz who gave uh, Amir Khan problems. He's a great person to follow in the ring because he makes opponents work. He made Sean Porter work. I didn't see this explosiveness in that fight. Well, it's there now, right? It's shocking. You know, let me let me just say, um, I can't name a more deserving opponent for Floyd Mayweather than this guy, right? I do believe, still, American is a great opponent too for Floyd Mayweather. But wow, Porter... Porter has the foot speed. Porter's two-handed. Porter can fight inside. Porter, what I like too, is when he comes in and he dazes you. He doesn't stand in front of you. Right? He hurts Malinaji, then suddenly he's over here. Right? Even if Malinaji woke up a bit and said, oh, let me try to counter, what would he counter? Porter wasn't even in front of him. Right, so let's figure out boxing for a second. Porter has a belt at 147. If Mayweather beats Maidana, he'd have two belts at 147. Floyd is going to have a lot of decisions to make after this Maidana fight. Let me point out, too, that if you watch the Maidana fight and if you feel that Maidana is too slow-footed, is too flat-footed to deal with Floyd on the balls of his feet, Right? Ask yourself if you would feel the same way about Sean Porter. This was an eye opener for me. Right? I, you know, let's just say I wasn't in the area code on this one. 
I wasn't in the ballpark. I was not in the country. Right, Sean Porter, I congratulate you. Uh, this fighter is dangerous. As I said, other guys who can move across the ring like this, Vladimir Klitschko, David Hay, they really have the ability to get as low as Porter. Porter's not the tallest guy. Right, they really have the ability to get as low as Porter and then to rip off the shots to the body that Porter can rip off. Right? Um, this kind of foot speed, this kind of ability to jump around to the sides once he hurts you, the fact that he hurts a pretty good defensive fighter, Paulie Malinaji, with both a left hand and a right hand. Right? Look at the video. I know, you know, Malinaji, put it this way, I know he goes down different times off different hands. But just understand, Malinaji didn't have an answer for either hand. Right? Afterwards, Malinaji, very classy, said, go be great to Sean Porter. Right? I, I believe Malinaji's still in shock at how Sean Porter was able to close the distance, right? Keep in mind, Malinaji is a guy who fought Shashenko, right? In Shashenko's backyard overseas. Shashenko has a great jab, right? Can keep guys outside. Shashenko's crafty. You saw how he beat Ricky Hatton. And there's not one time in that fight where Shashenko moves across the ring like Sean Porter does. And what's interesting with Porter is he doesn't get hit on the way in. He has great timing. Right? So uh, to Sean Porter, all I can say is uh, congratulations. Um, this fight definitely taught me a lot. He's a serious threat at 147. The kind of threat, quite frankly, that's going to have the fans demanding that he fight Mayweather or Pacquiao. That's the level of threat he is. Let me point out, too, that there's going to be some consolidation of the titles at 147. Right now, all three guys have titles. Right? All three guys. Right? If I'm Sean Porter, before I go fight Cal Brook, and let me just point out, as great as Sean Porter looked in this fight, I'm still not convinced on who wins the Sean Porter Kell Brook fight. Kell Brook is dangerous. If I'm Sean Porter, before I fight Kell Brook, I would seek greater glory by fighting Floyd Mayweather. Right? Like Amir Khan, I believe Sean Porter has better legs right now. He has younger legs right now than Floyd Mayweather. This is the kind of explosive fighter who would give anyone a hard time because you don't know where he's going to be in the ring. Right? He's a guy who can literally dodge your jab and get up on you and start doing work. And because he's short... And because he bends at the waist, and because he wisely jumps around you and changes the angles when he's up on you, he's hard to find in the ring even when he's knocking on your door. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. What I particularly want to hear about, because I've heard from fans of Keith Thurman, I've heard from fans of Kel Brook. I've heard from fans of Danny Garcia. Read the comments to the videos. Right now, everyone feels their guy is the man at 147. I heard from fans of Sean Porter and should have listened better before this fight. Right? Who is the king at 147? other than Floyd Mayweather. Lord knows I've heard from fans of Manny Pacquiao. Right? Who should Sean Porter fight next and why? What happens if Sean Porter fights some of the other guys 
we've mentioned. Let's talk 147 here in the comment section to this video. Thanks for stopping by.